that is something I would love to instill in every player I can. I think that um, it's really hard to set your ego aside and to embrace learning. But you know, something, something I say to players when they, you know, inevitably players will argue back with you every now and then. And uh, there's always there's always a few. And I'll and well, and I'll just I'll just ask them, do you want the player you are today to be the best player you're ever going to be? Welcome to the FC Game Changer Show. Joey's here with us today. Joey's the executive director for Pelada Football Academy, a nonprofit organization serving the youth soccer players in the Eugene Springfield area here in the state of Oregon. Uh, Joey isn't just the executive director for Pelada Football Academy, he is also the creator and founder as well as a coach. Uh, welcome to the show, Joey. Thanks for having me, Armando. Uh, Joey, it's nice to be here with you. I don't know if everyone know, when I graduated college, moved to Eugene, and uh, that was my first job as a coach yeah. out of college. You provided me with that opportunity, and uh, that was great for me for, you know, growing as a player as well as a coach. We also played together, and uh, I'm super excited for this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. To kick this off, let's... Uh, Let's understand the why you started the Lada Football Academy and uh, how it has grown over the years. I know it's been a decade now, so tell us a little bit more about this. That's right. Um, you know, the why really evolved out of um, my coaching experiences as a younger, younger player, even a, a child. I started coaching when I, was, when I was 10 years old, just assisting with my brother's teams and, you know, rec league stuff. Um, and ended up as a kind of in a head coach position when I was 16 years old. Um, again, rec league stuff, not not really competitive or anything. But but you know, growing up and working with kids, even when I was still a kid, and kind of being a youth mentor to to players was just a big part of my experience of, I mean, not only my childhood in general, but um, my experience of soccer was always colored by being both a player and an instructor. So. Um, you know, as I got into college, it was something I wanted to keep doing. I, I uh, found teams locally in Eugene through through kids sports, rec league stuff. Kind of did that on the side while I was going through undergraduate school. Um, and you know, the more I coached, and I, I also worked with FC Willamette, which was a club in town here, very much on the competitive end of the spectrum, won a bunch of state cups and things like that. So I was working in both of those environments. and. Um, what I found on both sides was families that, that basically said, you know what, we love good coaching, we love development, we love the model, and like having someone who knows the game and has the personality to work with the kids and is professional about the job. But you know, we also like, we play multiple sports, we wanna go away on vacation in the summer, like we wanna have control of our lives. Um, so I don't know, the story I kept hearing was basically, um, that families wanted all that good, positive developmental stuff, and especially wanted the positive approach from coaches, the you know non-abusive, non-over-the-top, the stuff that we see pretty frequently in the more elite, competitive environments. And that was never my personality, so that was something that I kind of naturally brought to the, the teams that I worked with. Um, and just after enough years of hearing this, and even some parents advocating, why don't you start your own club, and that kind of thing, sort of the, the day came where we had to break away from those rec leagues and build something of our own. Um, and I think the, the niche had sort of built itself and we found that our first season was back in the fall of 2012. We had 40 some players, a couple of girls teams and a boys team. Um, by the following spring, we had, we had maybe 115. Um, and within two, two and a half years, I think we had over 300 players. So it was, it felt like a very obvious niche that needed to be filled and the, and the philosophy is really um, provide good coaching and you know positive treatment of kids understanding their children understanding you're developing the person and and not just the player understanding there's more important things than winning um, but ultimately every coach in the academy is, is US soccer certified we did uh, Actually, in this room, we hosted a futsal course last spring. We brought the instructors down from Portland. We got 10 of our coaches 
um, futsal diplomas. We sent coaches up to goalkeeper licenses for through U.S. soccer coaches, United soccer coaches, um, back in the summer. So like we're we're really we aggressively pursue getting our coaches. Um, their own education, their own improvement, putting them on a path, working with me directly, trying to build like a long-term plan for their development. And, and so for me that our organization is, um, is special because we really toe that line between a philosophy of everybody plays and community oriented, um, not so, you know, preoccupied with, with winning state cups and, you know, the, the elite levels of performance. But at the same time, um, super invested in elite levels of development of, of our approach to teaching kids. Um, we have a, you know, an everybody plays policy. We don't run tryouts. Um, so it's, it's really about inclusivity. We allow kids to you know, choose, choose friend groups to some extent when we make our teams. Um, and you might even get to see some of your former players tonight that that you know one of the things that I I'm proud of is that we have kids that are seniors now who are still playing and part of that is because we've maintained mm -hmm. that community over time you know and we've tried not to burn players out you know and sort of isolate them from what they love most about the game which is often the community and the friends right that's that's interesting how did the the relationship with the young players and how, how did you know how to, you know, actually coach these kids? Because through coaching, yeah, you always had that coaching feel about you. But at the age of 16, how, do you, how did you know that you were ready to start coaching, you know, young athletes as well? I think a lot of that just had to do with being an older brother and being given a lot of responsibilities for my older brother in general. Um, and I just loved hanging around with him and, and working with him. Um, but you know, some of it is just, you get in that environment and you do it. And I, I started as just kind of through good fortune. I had one of, one of the parents who volunteered because it was AYSO in Corvallis. And, mm -hmm. It's all volunteer coaches, and most of them aren't super experienced with the game. So, you know, at some point, um, it was one of my, my brother's good friends. His dad was coaching the team, and he knew that I loved playing and basically, uh, I think, was kind of generous, invited me to come out and just hang out with them and, and be part of it. Um, and that was at 10 years old. So I loved that it. Was and at I, 10 years old? At 10 years old, yeah. Oh, and so, and so, you know, he, my brother was six. I was 10. And... Um, and I think that feeling I have for community really evolved through those years of kind of, um, you know, growing up where we did, teams tended to be uh, based around grade and usually two grades. So like, let's say that was a first and a second grade team that I was coaching. I was in fifth grade, let's say. Um, and, uh, and so the next year it would be a, uh, it would still be a fifth and sixth grade team, but now the kids that were younger were the older half of that team. So I kind of worked with three grades off and on from the age of 10 till the age of 18. That's so And I went and I worked with that. Once those kids got into high school, I went and volunteered with the high school and, and that kind of stuff. I, I think my first paid coaching job was at the, the indoor sports park playing the uh, you know, indoor arena soccer in Corvallis. Um, and they had a house team that they didn't have a coach for. So I think they hired me for like 38 bucks. <laughs> For the season, <laughs> you, you made it for the season, thirty-eight yeah, bucks for yeah, the season. I think, Good. if I remember correctly, I think it was something like that. Something. Um, yeah. So they, yeah, they, they. But you know, as a as a young kid, I think it was so positive to be trusted in that environment and to be, you know, to ask yeah. to take responsibility. Um, it's a formative experience for anybody. We have a program which um, um, we actually have a, a training session later today. Um, but we, we have a program that's really built around that concept. Can we bring kids in that are as young as 10, 11, 12, start training them as coaches, start putting them in an environment that's, that's nice. where they can have that experience that I had? Because for me, I mean, I think ultimately what I found in, in running a club is you need to have a, like a diverse skill set and you probably need to have skills you don't have, you know? Yep. So you have to keep acquiring them. You have to be willing to learn. Yeah. and. 
Um, you know, of course, there's like mistakes made along the way. You got to recover and 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 progress. And um, and I think that the key the key quality you have to have is just uh, you know enjoying leadership, enjoying kind of standing up and problem solving and and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, and ultimately, that that is what I feel like I learned in those years of being trusted with a level of responsibility. Um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a really special relationship between a player and a coach, especially when it's a, a positive one. It can be the worst relationship in the world, but when it's positive, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like a lot of the positives you get from a parent. Maybe it's some of the positives you get from an older brother or, you know, something like that from a sibling. It's, there's a component of family about it, but there's also, there's also something different. There's something that they, two people that didn't grow up together are always challenging each other in ways that, you know, maybe, maybe when you came from the same environment, you, you have the same ideas. Um, that stuff doesn't always get challenged in the way it does with, with a coach. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just a huge um, learning relationship. It's one that's um, emotionally really rich. Um, and yeah, you just, you just, you thrive in that if you embrace that relationship. So I think that our whole club is about trying to keep that relationship central between our players and our coaches, between our players and each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's, it's been almost 10 years now, right? A little over 10, yeah. A little over 10. Yeah. So, you may, so in the beginning, it was pretty much just you. Me and, yeah, I mean, you know some of the guys, Steve and, and So Steve Chris. has been with you since the yeah, start Steve, of everything. There were four coaches that were involved at the start. Um, you know Chris. Chris. Uh, and we had a goalkeeper coach named Chuck that was only with us for a couple of years. I don't but think I met him. You might not have. Um, good guy. And he, he, was, uh, he was definitely part of the, the start of this. And then we had, you know, we had a group of families um, that had kids that essentially were just loved the idea of, of what we brought to the table. And how did that start? Though? Like, did you guys come up to them and said, hey, this is the idea that we're having? It was almost the other way around. They um, came up to you. Yeah. So it was kind of, like I mentioned, I was, I was um, in undergraduate school and I wasn't necessarily, right. it wasn't like coaching was the only thing I did. I hadn't made a career out of it. You know, it was like I was, I was studying uh, literature and creative writing, you know, English at, at U of O here. Um, and uh, which has always been also an interest of mine and something I pursue, but they, it's, it's kind of hard to combine them. Is there anything uh, that helped you in that journey on the coaching side of things? Or the school journey? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, for me, I think, uh, you know, in the past, you and I have sat down and looked at curriculum, for example. Um, and I think I shared with you at the time, like, I. I'm just someone who needs to do something creative all the time. And that could kind of be a lot of different things. Yeah. I feel like it, it right now, um, the bigger Pelada grows, the more work I have to do, the more my projects center around soccer. But, you know, I think it's important to maintain other interests and, yeah. you know, take a uh, diversity of experience into what you do. Um, and ultimately, you know, this is kind of a longer conversation, but just to like to touch on it, um, I, I have kind of these these theories of learning around parallel thinking, parallel problem solving, like this idea that you can take a concept from one field and apply it to another, mm. learn more about the second field because of the contrast between those two things and the, and the possible relationships between them. Um, I think that all of us that have that have had more than one hobby in our lives have found ourselves finding a metaphor for learning in one that comes from the other. And the ability to do that, I mean, even, even I had, I studied English in, in college, but I, I had a professor that taught cosmology and astronomy. And wow. I, and like, I took some courses from him and I was never, um, I struggled with the calculus. My math isn't as good as <laughs> I'd like, but, um, but like the, the scientific concepts I loved. And, and when it comes down to it, I see, you know, sports as sort of celebrating physics because mm -hmm. ultimately that's what you're out there doing. You're running and jumping and kicking and throwing and whatever it is, but you are trying to master, you know, the physical dynamics of, of the game. So um, 
you know, s some players are more or less willing to, to take the classroom onto the field. But um, for me, as a coach, being able to apply some of those concepts and, you know, understand even some of the, like the math and the physics behind what we're trying to teach when it comes to converting it to technique or tactics. Mm -hmm. um, or I was having a great conversation with Steve the other day about um, the girls game and the boys game as you get into high school. We're forming our high school teams right now. And um, the, the growth and maturation of physical development of players and, and psychological development of players for boys and for girls, not only does it happen at different times, but it happens in different ways and it changes the way they play the game as they go forward. Um, so again, kind of a, a big topic there, but one that I think is, it's really nice to be able to apply those concepts in, in kind of a diversity of ways. So yeah, the school, if nothing else, kind of teaches you kind of how to create a pathway and learn, like everything's learning, so. You, you talked about the, the athlete, the athlete coaching relationship and you mentioned the positive and the, ne the negative ones as yeah, well. Yeah. I feel like the positive ones come naturally. It's, I would say, easier to deal with because it's all positive. Uh, how, how do you deal with the negative ones? Because th these are young kids. Yeah, yeah. And they're going through a lot and, and sometimes it just doesn't click. The hard thing is that the, the negative ones also come naturally. You know, there's... Interesting. You know, when they're, when they're two people who just don't see eye to eye, that, that happens without anybody trying, right? <laughs> you know, you can, you can fight that hard and it can be, and it can be bad. Um, I'd say from my own experience, it's, it's really interesting because when I kind of look back again at what were the formative things in, in my life, um, especially relating to soccer, it was absolutely, it was coaching as a kid. Mm -hmm. It was... Um, was playing pickup soccer with a, a Brazilian guy I gave a pair of shoes to. Um, he was a grad student of my mom's who worked at uni the Oregon State University. And I had just grown out of my, my copas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I, so I gave them to him and, and kind of say thank you. He took me to a pickup game on campus and it was, it was international students and like, you know, People, people of all ages from different parts of the world. And I look back on high school, like I remember my high school seasons, but that was my favorite thing, was just going and playing with everybody. Um, and then, yeah, but, the, but I also look at a moment that I had in, in uh, high school playing for, uh, I, was, I was 15 or 16, I was playing with a U16 team. Uh, it was between my sophomore and junior years. It was my first time making the sort of the regional competitive team in our area, the, the, the best team that we had around. And I had, I had tried out the previous year. I think I'd made the B team and decided not to play. Um, and I, I finally... You said B team, no, I'm, I'm out. No, you know I'm how not, it is. No. You know how it is. <laughs> I'm not doing I'm not this. that way now. <laughs> but I was, uh, you know, I, I grew up playing on a team. Part of this is, is, again, I think where the club comes from. I played on a team that was based around my school. So it was like a group of friends, but we played in a competitive league. Mm -hmm. um, so, sort of similar to what we do right now. Um, I love that, I love that environment. And, and so the, the choice not to play was not to, so much to not play soccer. It was kind of like, in order to leave that environment that I loved, I wanted to feel that I was going somewhere that was another level. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, and I chose not to, and it's, you know, it's an ego thing and a pride thing. And I think, you know, you learn, you learn to deal with that as you get older, but. Like, I'm going to train a little bit harder for the next one. And maybe yeah. I get to the 18. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know how it is at that age. You're always saying how it was the coach is not understanding you or valuing yeah, you or whatever else. I think there was a lot of, so, and this is why I'm getting to, to this, this experience I had when I made that A team. Because what I found is, um, it was the first time in my life that I was just sitting on the bench and, and not playing and, you know, not feeling valued. I'd been the captain of my team on my other team. I'd played all the time, you know, things you take for granted, right? And that are positive, part of your positive experience and that you don't really notice that there's someone else sitting on the bench when you're on the field. When you're on the field. Yeah. Um, so it was my first time having that experience of, of really not feeling valued. And I remember um, 
you know, missing a couple of training sessions and things for uh, uh, family stuff, whatever else. I honestly wasn't feeling very motivated. Um, and the coach gave me a call and said, what's going on? You're not, you're not showing up for stuff. You're missing too much stuff. And so coach approached you because he, he saw something was off. Yeah. And I, and I said, you know, it's, it's, I've got this going on and that going on. And honestly, it's really hard to feel motivated because I don't feel valued and I'm not playing. And he said, you're not playing because you're not good enough to play. Boom. <laughs> no one had ever told me that before. And how did you receive that? Um, I didn't blow up on the spot, like I held that in, but I spent like two to three days angry, you know, just angry all the time, like walking around. <laughs> did that motivate like, you a little bit more? So or? what it did, and th this is something that's interesting, I share this story with coaches that I work with because um, I think it's so important. I think that was probably the single most valuable interaction that I had with a coach growing up. But I'll qualify that by saying, um, I don't think the coach handled that the right way. So it became a huge learning experience for me and, and it led to a lot of growth for me. But if I look back and I say, who are my mentors? That coach isn't one of them, you know? Um, the, the coaches that I would consider real mentors are the ones who taught me sportsmanship and community and, and that kind of stuff. And, what I took away from that, and I'm, I'm very grateful that as a teenager, I was, it was probably my, it's probably my mom that, that helped me around to this. But um, eventually, once I'd kind of processed the anger at that, um, I sort of stepped back and, you know, we had four players on that team, three in particular, who were so much better than everybody else everybody in the squad. Else. You know, so much, and like, we've all been around that player, right? right. Where... You're kind of, you're fighting for time in this position or that position or whatever else. And then there's that one guy that nobody asks questions about because... Everyone knows. Not only does everyone know he's going to be on the field, but everybody wants him on the field, right? You can't right. imagine playing right. without, without that guy on the field, that. right? So we had, we had three of those guys in particular. I mean, one of them, I remember playing in a tournament in San Diego and he got fouled. We were given a free kick. He played it quickly, ran through, scored like from 30 yards out or something. Jeez. Referee said, no, 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 we weren't ready to go. Brought it back. He did it again. And he did it again. Like he did it again in the same play, in the same free kick. And, um, you know, this is like playing at the Nomads in, in San Diego. It was one of the oh biggest tournaments God. out there. And I just remember watching going like, these guys are forces of nature. You can't deal with them. Yep. And, and what that experience with my coach, you know, what I really got out of it that was positive was I realized that that conversation in my head that every player has at some point, you know, was all about like, like you and I both play right wing, right? Mm -hmm. And you're playing more than me. And I'm thinking like, but I do this better than Armando and you know, and you're like keeping score in your head and you're, and you're looking for fine margins why you should be the one who's first. And I stepped away from that and I was like, okay, there's like four or five of us that aren't playing much and I keep comparing myself to them. But what about those four guys that like, I know they're better than me. Like, they do everything better than me. And, uh, and how do they do it? And what can I learn from them? And I think what I took away from that conversation is like, learn from the best, learn from the people. Don't, don't keep comparing yourself to, to get that little margin that'll allow you to be on the field more, but try and understand what makes a really great player great. And the thing is, I don't think my coach led me to that realization. You know, and that's where I say I don't really see him as a mentor. He just put me in the in the crucible. You know, he he just right. kind of laid me flat, and then it was my job to to figure out how to recover yeah. from that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, as a coach, I always try and be someone that helps a player feel valued and find a positive pathway. Right? You have to be honest with a player, and there, I have no I have no issue with that. But you know. What I saw from that was also, this is, this is a player who was coming into the team for the first season, right? Because it was the first time I'd made that A team. He had a group of players he knew. I never felt invested in. I never felt truly brought into that squad. I never felt like I was, um, there was an effort put into building me into a player that would have a starting role. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that happens everywhere. 
at all kinds of clubs. You know, having that player that that's just, you know, positions. I don't know if if you're if you're looking at in terms of a starting eleven and then a ranked bench. You know, the last four to six players in that squad are often underdeveloped, undervalued. They're going to quit the game. They're paying. They're paying massive fees to be involved. Being they're getting no playing. positive feedback. Yeah. You know, they're they're not being treated like they're valuable. And I, I just think, you know, the more I work in this field, the more the most important thing we do is recognize that every child that comes to us has equal value, you know, regardless of their skill set. And it's very easy to treat the uh, the best ones really well and favor them. Right. Um, it's very hard to take a player that is maybe hurting the team's performance on the field and give them a key role that will allow them to develop. But the more years go by, and honestly, the less I care about winning, <laughs> the, more, the more you just take that player and you, and you develop them and you find a role. And I've, I've had so many positive experiences doing that, um, that for me, it's, it's probably really at the core of what I love about coaching. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. When, when, when there are, for example, two kids, same age, and on that same team, one is going to be the real best player on that team and then you have the one that it's not playing he's not playing she's not playing that much what do you think is the key difference there why is that kid way better than the other one that that's not performing well and they're trying to catch up but they they never achieve that level of understanding the game as much as the kid that's mm -hmm. already flying Uh, there's a lot of answers to that. I mean, and and also the context is important. So, for example, in our teams, without running tryouts, without having you know all of the strongest players naturally, without cutting kids that don't have the um, part of the answer to that for us personally is we just have varying skill levels. Like we just have a kid that comes in with a better skill set than another one, and so they're at different points in their development. But it. You know what you're. What it sounds like you're asking is a little bit more of like in that competitive environment where you're you're kind of fighting for space and maybe what are the key differences that maybe make a a, a big difference even if both players are yeah are, are kind of proficient exactly and all exactly that. because I, I we we talked about uh, uh, Messi and Cristiano right yeah. Messi yeah. is more the natural one and Cristiano has made him the elite soccer player that he is. Yeah. So, so what can we tell kids that they're trying as much as they can to become that elite, yeah. elite player, yeah. but they're just lost. They just yeah. see the other guy doing everything, helping the team, but they can't do that as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, so much of that is, is psychological. And I think, you know, if you want to take that all the way to the top level and look at Cristiano and Messi, that's, that's evidence, right? That there isn't one pathway because they took two very different pathways. Yeah. Yep. And they both achieved basically equally. I mean, everybody can make their argument about who's better. Who's better? And you and I both know. Yeah. But, uh, but, but very different pathways. And like, I remember, you know, watching Messi religiously and basically probably watched most of Cristiano's games too in that like 2010 yeah. to 2014, whatever, Barca and Madrid. And um, I remember the Ballon d'Or ceremonies and I remember, you know, Ronaldo winning it and then Messi winning it. I just remember how angry Ronaldo looked yeah. and the second year how angry he looked. And like the thing that I probably respect most about Ronaldo is that the third time Messi won it, he didn't look angry anymore. Like he went to work. I remember watching him and, and thinking like, like that gulf was so clear in 2010, 11, 12, 2012 in particular, right? When Messi scored. I was, I was at the camp now for, oh, you were there, huh? for Barca Atletico Madrid in December when he scored his 91st or 92nd goal of that year, like the year he broke the record. So I was at that game. Um, amazing. But you, kinda, you watched him play and you assumed he was going to score two goals in every game he played. And you watched Ronaldo and you're like, this guy is unbelievable. If Messi didn't exist, you would have nobody to compare him to, right? But because Messi exists, 
he, he feels like a yeah. lesser thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember watching him going like, how is he going to catch up with this guy, right? Because he's so good, but what can he do? And I remember watching games going like, well, he could learn to use his left foot. He's going to need two feet to beat Messi's left foot, right? But that's the example, right? You're talking about development. And, mm -hmm. and I swear he did the same thing. He sat there at the third ball and dare door ceremony and just was like, I'm gonna to learn to use that one. Exactly. I'm, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do every everything. Use every tool that I have, and that is like the peak example of a player who. That's. I think that's why you say he made himself. Like he mm -hmm. recognized that he was up against something so unique, arguably undevelopable, right? Um, and he went and used absolutely every resource at his disposal, and he did it successfully. And I mean, he's got more goals than Messi. Monster. You know? He's a, he's, yeah, he's a monster. So I think that's, that's just the truth of it. And then, you know, part of what I loved that when, when I started watching Barcelona was in 2010 and they were fielding a group of kids from the academy, you know, and like, because I'm in coaching and I'm in player development, the idea that at the highest level of the game, you could have a group of friends that, that, uh, you know, grow up playing soccer together as kids and learn to do it in a certain way and love playing and the joy of the way they played. Um, yeah, it was just like, I've never seen anything like it before or since. So, and I, and I think when you watched Messi, especially in those years, the level of love for just having the ball at his feet and for the teammates he had around him and the way they shared the ball, the, the level of trust, like that is something I think you only build from childhood upward. You know what I mean? It's, it's very hard. And we see that when we watch the professional game there's definitely the, you know, the players that kind of get called mercenaries, the ones that, that have an individual skill set that is so valuable, they kind of get shipped around from club to club for whoever will pay for it. Exactly. Um, but you watch just that, how special that time and place was with Messi and the group of players around him. I think that's why people say you can't, you can't make a player like that, you know? I mean, the truth is you, you can, but you have to start when you're, that, 12, exactly. You know, 10, whatever that you have to, and you have to build not only that player as an individual and not only their psychology as an individual, but their sense of community and, and belonging in the place they're at. I mean, you look at him, go to PSG and he's the same player, but he's not, you know, exactly. and, and I think he's regaining some of that and you he's see it this year, but, um, yeah. So, so when you look at the, probably the single biggest difference between a player who is thriving and a player who is struggling is just the psychology mm -hmm. if they are athletically and technically similar right it's it's rare to have a player who's just a physical anomaly i mean erling holland or mbappe what do you do about that i don't know if you can tell someone how to compete with a player like that but um you look at millions of players worldwide playing at the top level they're all kind of the same speed same strength, same, you know what I mean? We all train yeah. and we do what we can to build ourselves into being a, a strong, fast, you know, but, but no, the, the best players make the best decisions the fastest yeah. and players are, are going to make those decisions better and faster when they feel confident and they feel good, they feel trusted. So that's when the coaching yeah. and, and, and that's where you, you, it's so common to see that sort of spiral of you drop from the from the starting lineup. You get sat on the bench. Your confidence drops. We're starting to see that with Cristiano in yeah. Manchester yeah. United. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing. It's very hard to deal with because I mean, now I think it's more mental than anything else with him. Yeah. So it, yeah, I just I just want to make sure that kids they, they if they understand that it is possible, even though let's say you 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 were not born like Messi did, right? We're comparing, you know, with Messi. We, we yeah. can't do that, but yeah. he's more of the natural side of the, the, the game. But if you put in the work, you can definitely improve 10X. You can definitely find ways to also compete at a very good level yeah. as well. Yeah, you can. I, I, I would just argue though, you know, if you want to break down what, what we mean collectively when we say natural, it's not like he doesn't train. It's not like he doesn't put in the work the way Cristiano does, you know? He, he does, he works. You think he works more on that 
athleticism I, side of things I think, than Cristiano? I think the biggest difference is that Cristiano is motivated by his ego. Like he wants to be the best. He want, and so when he works, he works toward that goal. And I think Messi just wants to like play and score goals. He's like, I'm just you know? happy playing ball. And so when he trains, like there's a joy behind it. Um, I'm not saying that, that Cristiano doesn't enjoy it, but I think like the ego is so central to his experience of the game and his enjoyment that that is almost never going to be able to step aside and let someone else take center stage. You know what I mean? It's almost right. inevitable that there will be a point where he'll always be Cristiano and he's always going to be an absolute legend, but he's also going to be 40 years old trying to be a legend, you know? Yeah. yeah. Whereas like, you watch Messi play right now and he'll just go from being the best goal scorer to the best passer in the game and eventually he'll, he'll go do something else. But... Uh, um, I guess this goes back to, you know, the story I shared about my experience with my coach. I mean, what my coach did that was such a positive for me is kind of like kill a part of my ego, you know, that I was that player going like, but I'm better than I'm better than this. Yeah. And I'm, you know, and I'm and he kind of just come in and, and as as harshly as anyone had ever told me, <laughs> just said, yeah, well, you're not good enough. And uh and you need to have that experience sometimes, you know? And the thing is, you can overcome that by denying it, which in a way is what we're talking about with Cristiano, right? right. It's like he refused to say, all right, this guy's just better. Yeah. And, and he went and made himself the best possible player he could be. I didn't do that, right? I just, I just said like, oh, Bummer. you're kind of right, yeah. you know? I'm gonna have to work harder. But in a different way, you know, I don't think that I came in with the mentality of like, I'm going to be as good as those three guys. Mm -hmm. It was more like, I probably could be better now than I am if I had chosen to learn from them instead of trying to be better than that guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, that is something I would love to instill in every player I can. I think that... Um, it's really hard to set your ego aside and to embrace learning. But, you know, something, something I say to players when they, you know, inevitably players will argue back with you every now and then. And uh, there's, always, there's always a few. And, I'll, and, well, and I'll, just, I'll just ask them, do you want the player you are today to be the best player you're ever going to be? Ooh. And what, what's the, the answer to that? What do they say? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah and and the thing is that, like, that's actually a great question that will make them think oh wait a minute yeah that's that's actually no i'm gonna work to be you know as yeah. good as I, yeah the the key component there is are you open to the idea that you don't know everything right now are you open to the idea that you're gonna know things tomorrow and do things tomorrow better than you do better today you do and what is the quickest pathway from today to that point you know what i mean is the more and it's it is hard I can't say it's easy you can't just take every piece of advice that anybody throws at you you have to filter everybody has to filter right and that's one of the skills we learn with time and it takes a lot of time is is being able to kind of instinctively know that uh, a piece of advice is worth while or in my situation being able to take what was arguably a bad piece of advice is someone who there are dozens of players given the same feedback who quit the next day, who don't come back and play. Yeah. You're not good enough? Okay, then I'm not going to play. Yeah. I've seen it over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go and tell players you're just not good enough. You, you, you give them some feedback. You give them something to work on. Yeah. You give them something yeah. positive, you know, um, to, to couple with that. Um, so that's a huge part of what I think our mission is as a club. But... Um, no, it's, it's hard to take a piece of, of whether it's criticism or advice or even positive, positive feedback can be harmful, you know? That's true. You tell, you tell a player over, and again, over again, you're great at this, you're great at this. They, get they lazy. underdevelop other yeah. things. They, they start to see themselves in a really narrow framework. Mm -hmm. They struggle to adapt and adjust. And, and so, yeah, that there's, it's, it's really hard to navigate all this stuff. I think that's why it's important to have um, access to coaches who, who not only know the game, this is, 
you know, what I've always said to people in the, like in the hiring process, you and I talked about this yeah. years ago. Um, I'm very upfront with people and uh, I remember talking to you and saying, I know you, like, you're a great player, you play at a high level. Um, the first challenge you're gonna have with us is you're gonna have to work with players who aren't at your level. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna have to treat them like humans and not sit them on the bench exactly. and you know, all that. And I, and I have that conversation with every coach I bring in and just say, this is not an environment where you can ignore the bottom 25% and wait till they go away. Mm -hmm. you know? You're gonna come and elevate them. And to me, that mission is more important than having the next national team player or something like Definitely. that. Definitely, you know? Definitely. So, Joey, uh, uh, now we're in, in World Cup right now. Uh, the U.S. unfortunately just lost. And to me, it's one of the, the better teams that they've had for, for many years. Young kids, motivated. Maybe in the next World Cup, they'll be a lot better, more mature, experienced. But I think there's something lacking. That's my opinion in terms of the soccer being popular or maybe not as popular in the United States. Yeah. Uh, where, where do you see, uh, uh, or if you see soccer becoming more popular in the next five to ten years yeah. in the U.S.? Yeah, I do, I do. Um, you know the, you know the TIFO football channel? TIFO. No, I don't. On YouTube? I you don't. should look it up. I'll um, look it up. I've showed you some videos from it, but you might not remember from years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a British channel that does uh, like tactical analysis. T-I-F-U? T-I-F-O. TIFO. TIFO. Yeah. Anyway, I use it as a, as a training tool, but that's a side point. I, I only bring it up because they just published a video on this question of popularity. And they're, they're great about using stats and they take it outside the game and, and um, you know, look at kind of the cultural background and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, just last week, I think they, they put out a video on the popularity of soccer in the U.S. specifically. So I kind of have some like interesting statistics on this from that video, but bottom line is um, you're right. Soccer is, I think they said the fourth most popular sport in the U.S., but that it is far behind football, the wrong football. Um, the wrong football. Sorry. The, the throw ball. Basketball. Hand egg. <laughs> People are going to get mad at us. Sorry. Um, no, football, uh, basketball, and, and baseball. Mm -hmm. and, but it is also the fastest growing in terms of popularity of any of the sports. So it's, it's gaining it's ground. It's, it's far behind, but gaining ground. Uh -huh. um, and then when you look at uh, gener what is it, Generation Z, the young people Gen these Z, days, yes. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. something like 50% of them say they're soccer fans. So, if you That's look at a news. generational shift coming, maybe not five, maybe not even 10 years, right? But I think, look at Gio Reyna, right? How many times in the past have we had the son of a soccer exactly. legend playing for the national team? You know what I mean? There's a culture for the game, which is beginning to become deep culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, part of what we see is the U.S. team, as talented as some of the individuals are, feels like a, a workmanlike team. Like they are working to compete all the time. Whereas you watch Brazil, Argentina, France, and like playing is a celebration, you know, of their skill, of their community, of their culture, of their legacy, their tradition. You know what I mean? There's so loads much. of pressure on them. And I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it's it's effortless or anything like that. But I think all of us can think back on any sport, really. The the dynasties, the very best ones. They just looked like they were having fun. It didn't look labored. And I think the U.S. men's team is still at that point where it does look labored. And I don't mean that as a put down, but it, like they're in that let's work hard, let's build a legacy stage. Mm -hmm. Don't have the legacy. We ought to be talking about the women's team because if you look at the women's team, like, they win everything and they have that legacy and they ha and you watch them play, and it's the the polar opposite. Like everything is a celebration of yeah. of of skill and know how and culture and tradition. So it's really interesting that uh, I'm sure it's interesting for you being from Brazil that that you know in the U.S. not so much now as before, but when I was growing up, we were told that soccer is a, a girl sport. 
And the rest of the world just goes like, yeah. What? <laughs> That's, yeah. that's so interesting. To, to me, you know, coming from a country like Brazil, right, everyone, you were born with a soccer ball in yeah. your crib. So it, yeah. it's, that's what you're going to be. Mom, yeah. dad, oh, that's going to be the next soccer player. Yeah. Right. And uh, I don't see it happening here, but there's also, which I think is a positive thing, right? Over here, a kid has many choices in high school. Yeah. They can run track. Yeah. They can play basketball. They yeah. can play football. They can play vo a bunch of sports. In Brazil, you don't have many options. Yeah. So you're always just playing the game. And what's interesting, going to the next question, is a country like Brazil, you, you're playing futsal for a long time before you go into the pitch. Now, some of that's even facilities, right? Like, that's my impression. I've traveled in South America. We have resources here that the rest of the world can only dream of. Exactly. You know, it drives me nuts, exactly. actually, as a club administrator, like the number of resources we have and how difficult it can be to actually get a field, even though we have all mm -hmm. that. But I know in South America, like, even if you're playing outdoors, a lot of times it's in like little caged in right. five aside fields exactly. or 77 fields. Like Almost nobody plays 11 v 11. Ball. Exactly. Like we have adult 11 v 11 leagues here. They're just recreational all the time. I didn't get to, like, there aren't the facilities in the, in the space by population, you know, like mm -hmm. it's just not as accessible. Futsal for, for developmental pur purposes, futsal is, I think the key components are just, um, you know, five aside compared to 11 v 11, you get something like eight times as many touches per game, per game. you know? Um, the more contact you have with the ball, the more repetitions you get. Same, same philosophy that we look at for training. Maximize repetitions, exactly. maximize game-like quality of the exercise. Um, yeah, the, the futsal does all that stuff naturally, so I don't even know how much it's futsal versus small-sided. Small but the other thing that futsal obviously does with a, a ball that doesn't rebound and bounce around so much is it sticks to your foot, so you spend you just spend more time with the ball in play. It's more skill oriented as opposed to athletic, you know, mm -hmm. knocking the ball down the field, seeing who can run the fastest. It really relies on, on your ability to control the ball. And, and, yeah, and that so. translates well to, to going outside and playing. For sure, for 11, sure, 11. for sure. Yeah. yeah. World Cup, who are you rooting for? Uh, Messi. No, not Argentina, Messi. I, I actually have, I've spent a lot of time in Argentina, so yes, Argentina. It's, it's bummer, but not Brazil? He just... Brazil second, maybe? I've, I've, I've been on the Brazil side of Iguazu Falls, but that, I didn't get any farther. I will go, I will go. I love the Brazilian team, but Messi's last World Cup, so. Yeah, I, I really, really, really... Brazil's gonna win, that's, that's my belief. Right, but I, I, I really wish we had one more World Cup that Messi could play and win that one. You have a very young Brazilian team. You guys can win the next one. Uh, no, I think that's coming. That's coming. <laughs> we, we, have, we need to beat Argentina, actually. On the way? To, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. So that's going to, I think, semi, semi final could be against them. So that's going to be a good team. Okay, let's uh, kind of go yeah. into. One of the last questions here, we always ask the same question to every single guest that we have in the show. And it's, uh, tell us a game changer moment in your life. The one I shared with you is, is really maybe the one that I, I would identify as the most um, kind of pivotal, like things changed after that, mentality changed, approach changed, everything. Well, I'll give you another one that's more fun. Um, and that is actually as a, in my, my early 20s, coaching with um, uh, Tom Rowney, who was the director of FC Willamette. And he's, uh, he's probably the best coach that I've worked with personally um, and has a long legacy of, uh, he's, uh, I think he's from Newcastle, um, but he's been in the US for most of his life. And, started his own businesses here in his own club. He worked for the Sounders for a while. I think he worked with OSU's team. Um, and as a player, he was a, he was a goal scorer. He was the first person as a very young coach, you know, when I was just getting into my early 20s, 
um, and having grown up in, you know, in the Valley and in Oregon here, we weren't exposed to a lot of high level players, you know, like we had, we had coaches and we knew some good kids, but like, it's, it's a different thing when you meet a player or a coach who has that pedigree. And I just remember him demonstrating um, volleys, like half volleys. And in my mind as a kid, always having thought that like, if you score a volley or a bicycle kick or something, it's like 80% luck and 20% skill. You know what I mean? That, like you just had this miraculous moment that, that's once in a lifetime. And I just remember him pinging these volleys in with like 100% consistency. 100 and in a controlled environment right I'm not talking like in-game play and all that kind of stuff but but even at that you know it was a revelation for me to look at a player and say like you can have the level of technique that in your 50s after knee surgeries and like not being you're, you're still so completely consistent in your technical execution of the basics and it changed the way that I thought about the game in general it took a whole bunch of, and I think this is something that young players often struggle with, like you honestly believe that more than half of what happens is random, is chance, is like the luck of the draw, you know what I mean? And you're constantly in your head going like, well, that was bad luck, and that was, you know. You tend to curse bad luck more than you acknowledge good luck, good luck yeah. but, because uh, when, when it's good, it was because you were skillful. Exactly. But, uh, no, I, I think that, that that was massive for me. And I remember, um, you know, growing up, I was, I kind of went back and forth between being a central midfielder and a defender. And, and the thing I was worst at was goal scoring. I was a good passer of the ball, I was good, athletic, and read the game pretty well, good defender. Terrible in front of goal, which I think was probably more psychological than anything, you know? Like, when you identify yourself as not being a good goal scorer, you don't score goals. <laughs> Um, and we played an exhibition game, which uh, Tom was was uh, you know bringing like the very the guys he brought over from England, you know, to coach in camps and that kind of stuff. Uh, a different level, huh? So he put together. I mean, like I could play with them. There was no, they, they weren't professionals. They were just guys from England. Like you I say see, about, like you say about Brazil. Like you take any random kid out of Brazil, and he's gonna look like. Yes, uh, a really good player here, you know, most just, likely just because. Um, so, no, I don't think we were an exceptional group, but we played these exhibition games, and I remember having one that, I, you know, maybe we tied it 2-2 or something like that, and I had a couple good chances. I mean, not no-brainers, but, like, inside the 18-yard box, central, kind of had a little bit of space, guided over the bar, that kind of stuff. And um, for that particular game, he had given me a ride, like it was in Portland, and he was, we were, so we drove back to Corvallis together, and uh, we're just chatting along the way. And I, I remember him uh, kind of giving me a, a look, because we're talking about, you know, goal scoring, and I'm, I don't know if I said something about bad luck or just not being sure, and, and uh, so he, he said something to me that kind of stuck with me, and I've shared this with so many players afterwards. And he said, scoring goals isn't about being able to score from anywhere. It's not about, you know, these acrobatic things and these amazing efforts. It's about knowing what you do well, knowing how to put yourself in that position and get the ball. And the guy that, that I kind of just watched YouTube videos and studied after that was Thierry Henry because if you look at his reel of goals I mean so many goals how many of them were scored from the left corner of the 18 yard box you know how many of them were curled right footed into the far post from the same position over and over again and that's what you know Tom said is basically like you watch you watch a player who scores a lot of goals I mean with the exception maybe of Ibrahimovic right almost all of them, it's, it's not that they score every kind of goal imaginable, it's that they score, and, and looking at Messi again, I mean, that guy, what really struck me watching him in like the middle of, early middle of his career, the reason I thought he scored so many more goals than everybody is he'd figure out something, like his little dink chip shots, for example, mm -hmm. and he'd do that six games in a row, and he'd score that goal, and defenders would start to, to like defend him, and stop that particular way of scoring. Mm -hmm. So he'd find a, a permutation, like he'd do it a different way. And then he'd do that six to eight times in a row. 
And like, I remember just seeing, if you watch, there's lots of YouTube videos of like all of his career goals. If you watch those, you'll notice that you see runs of the same goal mm -hmm. for maybe two months or something like that until defenders adapt and then he adapts. And then instead of like just scoring one goal, he scores 10, you know? And that over the course of a career leaves him where he is now, right? Yeah. It's, it's not, there's so many players out there who have scored incredible goals, but can they do it every week, every week yeah. you know? And, and with that level of consistency. So, no, I think that was, a, that was a moment for me was just seeing the ability to be so technically precise, seeing that that was an option, that you didn't have to rely on, you know, luck. Um, and then, and then having that kind of insight about how we create the environment for success, you know, in, in a literal sense, in the, in terms of goal scoring, that you have to have done all the work to, to take up the right starting position, make the right run, draw defenders into the right places, you know, that I was so focused on, if I get the ball, I'm going to try and score this time instead of I'm going to play in this position to get into this place, to get the ball in this way, to take a shot at that corner yeah. with this technique. And like, I took out a bag of balls and I just practiced and practiced and practiced. And like, by the time I met you, I scored a lot of goals. Lot of goals. Like, but I didn't learn to do that until my mid to late twenties. And I would have loved to have coaches, you know, younger who gave me yeah, that exactly. Um, as a player, it came very late for me but that's probably the biggest moment that led to me just changing the way I played and the level of success I experienced. And I hope a lot of young athletes are listening, watching this as well, because there's hope, Yeah. right? Yeah. There's hope that the younger you are, the better it's gonna be if you sure. put in the work. For sure. So, yeah, this is great. Uh, Joey, uh, just tell everyone uh, where people, uh, can find you, can find Pelada, what social media platforms you guys in, and uh, what's the best way for them to, if there is a family trying to get in contact yeah, with you, yeah. what's the best way? The, the best thing is to start from our website, which is peladafa.org. Um, it uh, should have all the resources they need, schedules, programs. Um, my contact information is at the bottom of that page. Uh, very easy to, to find and get a hold of me. People are very welcome to reach out. I try and stay very personally involved with, you know, the parents and the coach a bunch of teams. But yeah, I'm the main point of contact. So um, uh, me and, and our registrar, Brenda, who's also on the, on the page there, and she can help with registration, but I'm always happy to answer questions. We have, uh, we have Instagram, Facebook, I think we have a Twitter as well. You can find us through those as well. But yeah, our website is where all the, like, the most information is. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope to catch you soon. FC Game Changer, the football club that will change your game.